Romans chapter 5. We are continuing our study of the book of Romans. Finished chapter 4 last week. And our passage for today is going to be Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. The Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Amen. The Apostle Paul has spent the last four chapters, all of the first four chapters, um, explaining to us how a person is justified before God. How can a sinner be accepted by God? Um, In the first two and a half chapters, he declared that all people have sinned, all people have broken God's law and therefore stand guilty before God, and there's no amount of good works or religious works that can remove our sin, that can remove the guilt that we have before God. And Paul has told us that there is only one way in which a person can be justified before God. There's only one way that God can look at a person and declare him to be righteous, and that is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Those who trust in him are forgiven of their sins and are given the righteousness of God, they are accounted righteous, not because of something that they have done, but because of the work of Jesus Christ on their behalf. It's not that the moment that we believed we we suddenly reached moral perfection, but the righteousness of Christ is accounted to us, and therefore God declares us to be just. And so our passage today begins with the words, Therefore, having been justified by faith, and moves on from there. He has spent four chapters explaining how a person is justified before God through faith in Jesus Christ. And now, over the next four chapters, he is going to be giving us what some of the results of justification are. The major theme over the next four chapters now that we have been justified, is our assurance of eternal salvation. The main theme over the next four chapters is that those who have been justified will be glorified. Uh, To put it in uh, more common evangelical 20th century language, the point that Paul is going to make over these next four chapters is that if you are justified, you're not going to lose your salvation. You are going to make it to the end. This is his point in chapter 5. In chapter 6, he's going to answer some objections to this. In chapter 7, he's going to give further explanation. And then in chapter 8, he's going to get back to this and close it all up, ending in his triumphant declaration at the end of chapter 8 that he is convinced that there is nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is where we're going. That is where we're heading, and this is where we're beginning this journey to reach that here in the beginning of chapter 5. Most people, when they think, most other religions, shall we say, when they think of justification, God's, God rendering his verdict on your life, they think of the last day, the last judgment, and they assume that they're the only time that you can know if you are going to go to heaven or go to hell, will be on the last day when God either justifies you or condemns you. But Paul has told us that the believer, for the believer, God's verdict has already been given. The person who believes in Christ has already been justified and therefore does not need to fear condemnation. Romans 8, 1. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, but are secure in Christ. We've been going through the book of John in our Bible study on Thursdays, and not too long ago, we were in John chapter 5, where Jesus declares that those who believe in him have, past tense, passed from death unto life. 
This is the major theme of the next four chapters. And so we're going to be talking about this a lot for a while. So again, getting into our text, it begins by saying, therefore, having been justified by faith. So that's a quick summary of everything that we've seen thus far. Note, before I even go on, note that for believers, justification is something that is already past. Having been justified by faith, that happened. First of all, keep in mind that the work of Christ on the cross has been accomplished. It is finished. He has paid for your sins. Christ lived a perfect life, a perfectly righteous life. He has fulfilled all righteousness that can be, account, that can be accounted to you. And he has died on the cross to bear your sins so that your sins do not are not going to be accounted to you. And in time when we believe this blessing of justification is applied to us by the grace of God. So justification for the believer has happened. It is a past act of God. So what are the results now of justification? First thing, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Note that after we are justified, we have peace with God, which means that before we were justified, before we believed in Christ, I could just say we didn't have peace, but let me state it in stronger terms. We were at war with God. If you ask your average unbeliever, the average person on the street, he will not tell you that he's hostile towards God. He'll just say, I'm, in, I, I'm indifferent towards God. I'm neutral towards God. I don't bother him. He doesn't bother me. I got nothing to do with God. He's got nothing to do with me. But that's not how the Bible describes the relationship of the unbeliever with God. Um, this concept of, well, I just have nothing to do with God is actually sin because God has created us for his glory, to glorify him. Back in chapter 1 of Romans, we read that God is our creator, and people know this truth, but what do they do? They suppress the truth in unrighteousness and worship the creation rather than the creator who is blessed over all. And so people dedicate their lives to a million things other than God. And this is not something that God just, who created us, who put us here for a reason, for his own glory. This is not something that God looks at and says, ah, that's fine. We're just neutral. I got nothing to do with you. You got nothing to do with me. No, Romans 1 begins with the statement that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul speaks of unbelievers, or all of us, by nature, are children of wrath. This idea that, oh, we can just be neutral towards God is a lie. That's not true. God has told us how to live. God has told us how we are to glorify him. And every time that we lie, cheat, steal, sin, every time an unbeliever sins, every time we sin, we're in essence saying to God, I'm not going to do what, you're gonna, what you tell me. I know that you have spoken. I know what you're saying. I know that I'm supposed to live for you, but I'm not doing that. I will not have you rule over me and tell me what to do. In Romans 8, which we will get, we'll get to in a while, um, Paul says that the natural mind, that is the mind of the unbeliever, the person who is not controlled by the Spirit of God, but by the flesh, the natural mind is enmity against God. He does not say it's neutral, it could go either way. It is enmity, an enemy of God. And if you're still not convinced, just look a few, look, look a few verses further down in Romans 5. We'll get to this in a couple of weeks, but look at Romans 5, verse 10. 
For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. When we were what? When we were enemies of God. And we have been reconciled through the death of his son. One of the central themes of the New Testament is the concept of reconciliation with God. If there is need for reconciliation with God, that means that there is a problem. There is hostility. There is conflict between us and God. We're not at peace. We're not neutral. There is hostility. The Bible states that we are at war with God. We are enemies with God. In fact, let me state this even harsher. God is at war with us. You want to go through how many times the prophets in the Old Testament, and we can look at places in the New Testament also, where it speaks of, of God as this warrior ready to crush his enemies. That's in the Bible. This idea that, oh no, God is this big grandfather in the sky, and God is love, so he never, everything is fine. Everything is fine. God is love, but God is also holy, and God is also righteous, and we have to have a balance in our theology. We need to understand that God's love doesn't mean that we just sin away and do whatever we want. God cannot ignore sin. God hates sin. In Romans 1 and 2 and 3, we've seen the whole point of two and a half chapters was first he talked about how the nations have all turned against God, Jews, same thing, they've all sinned against God's law, and he summed it all up by saying, there is none righteous, no, not one, there is no fear of God before their eyes, everyone is against God, and God looks upon this evil of man, and it's not that everything is fine, it's not fine, and we need reconciliation, and it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that brings reconciliation. The gospel, the good news, is that God, not us, God did something to end the war. And that is he sends his son to die on the cross for our sins. So that which separated us from God, which was our sin, that which brought the conflict, that which caused the war between us and God, our sin, has been removed, has been taken away through Christ, and therefore we can have reconciliation and peace. In Isaiah chapter 40, there's this incredible passage. After going through chapter after chapter of um, harsh judgment passages, the prophet states this. He says, comfort Yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended and that her iniquity is pardoned. This is a foreshadowing of the gospel. Having been justified by faith, that's in the past, we now, present, have peace with God. You know, a couple of days ago, it was um, 28th of October, big national holiday, the day we, Greece, entered into the Second World War, when the Italian ambassadors came and said, just surrender, so it doesn't have to be a lot of bloodshed, and we said no, and the war, Greece entered the war, and Stavrilo was talking with her grandfather, who was almost 95. And he remembers it. He remembers it. He was 12 at the time. And he remembers all these older, not older, young men. He was too young to go fight, but other young men who are 18 years old. He remembers them all getting on the truck, piling up, and all their mothers and all their sisters and all their grandmothers crying. He remembers that, going off to war. And you think of terrible wars that have happened. And then I'm sure there was great rejoicing when that war was over. But there's a problem. Then there's another war. And then that war is over. And then there's another war. 
and then that war is over, and then there's another war. In human, it, the peace of the world is very fragile. It's not something that lasts. You never know when it just might flare up again and people will start fighting again. But there's a massive difference between the peace that, world, that the world has, which can just disappear in an instant, and the peace that Paul is talking about here, which is through Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Do you remember when, on the night that he was betrayed, a little before he's crucified, and Jesus is speaking to his frightened disciples, and he says to them, here's what I leave with you. I leave my peace. My peace I give to you, not the way the world gives it to you. This is not the kind of peace that you can have in the world. This is the peace of Jesus Christ. And he says, do not let your heart be troubled, nor be afraid. This is a peace that Paul is talking about here that is not based upon my works, my religious works. Well, I'm able to get stuff done and therefore God is happy with me. But, you know, if I mess up, well, there you go. Sorry, now God is hostile towards you again. No, this is a peace that is based upon the work of Jesus Christ as he has justified you. This verse here, I'm going to read it again. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This verse alone, if there was nothing else in all of Scripture, this verse alone gives me assurance of salvation and assurance of forgiveness. If there was nothing else, I could read this verse and say, we're not going to lose our salvation. We have peace with God. I cannot fathom the concept. Let's assume that, you, let's assume that I believe that you can lose your salvation. So Paul is here saying, we have been justified before God. Christ died on the cross for us. He loved us. He gave himself for us. He has declared us right in his sight. He has reconciled us to himself. We have peace with him. But you could still mess up and go to hell. No. No. This is a peace that is based upon the finished work of Christ, which is done. And it is a peace that is everlasting. Let's go to verse 2. <laughs> verse 2. Through whom, that is through Christ. Also, we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. There was way, way too much in this passage to deal with, so I'm only going to deal with half of it and we'll pick up next week again somewhere in the middle of this i want to deal with the first part through christ we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand ordinarily when paul uses the term grace he's talking about god's grace toward us and salvation is the gift of god showing us his grace here he's using it in a, in a, in a slightly different way He's talking about grace as a, as a state in which we stand, a realm in which we stand. Um, the absolute pinnacle of God's grace is the work of Jesus Christ on the cross for our salvation. And so the person who is united to Christ through faith, the person who is in Christ, he is standing, so to speak, within this state of, of grace. Grace is that which characterizes your life, your standing, your status before God can be characterized by this word, grace. You're standing in the grace of God. Or in other places he says we stand under the grace of God. But Paul uses a familiar terminology here. He says we have access to this grace through Jesus Christ. We come into this state of being under the grace of God, we have access to it through Jesus Christ. This language of having access, 
to God and to the blessings of God has always been a major issue in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, right from the beginning. Right from the beginning when God created Adam and Eve and they have access to God, They're, they have communion with God in the Garden of Eden and everything is wonderful. And then they sin. They rebel against their God. They rebel against their creator. And now they're cast out of the garden. And what does God do? He places an angel with a flaming sword so that, to block the entrance back in. You're not allowed to come back. You, you, because of your sin, you can't have the kind of relationship that you had with God as before. So there's this access denied to the creature because of his sin. And you can go on. You get to when Moses goes at Mount Sinai. He's with the people. And God says to Moses, all right, I want you to come up onto the mountain and I will give you my law. But he says, I'm making this exception for Moses, but no one else is allowed to come onto the mountain. No one else is to, is to climb up into the mountain. If anyone sets a foot on the mountain to come towards God, he's to be killed. And in fact, just to be able to sit at a distance and watch the, the smoke and the fire and the lightning and all these things, the people had to cleanse themselves just because they're close to the presence of God. And then, of course, you know I was going there. You have at the tabernacle and subsequently the temple. You have the temple and inside the temple or the tabernacle as the case may be you have the holy of holies which represents the very throne of god and here's where the ark of the covenant is and it, it separates the rest of the world with this thick veil no one is allowed to go back there the only person that is allowed to go back there is one person the high priest of israel no one else. Not only that, but he's not allowed to go back there whenever he wants. He can only go back there one day a year on the Day of Atonement. But even then, he can't just decide to go back there. Oh, it's the Day of Atonement today, so I'm going to go back there. No, he has to have performed the right sacrifices for himself, for the people, and then he has to have the blood to go and sprinkle on the covenant, and only then he will be accepted. Again and again, you see this there's no access to God. And if there is, there's huge limitations. You're not allowed to enter into the presence of God because of sin. And there are specific rules. You're not allowed to pass through the veil. You're not allowed to come into the presence of God because of sin. Until that day in Jerusalem when our Lord Jesus died on the cross and the sky turns black and there is a great earthquake, and we're told the veil of the temple. And this is not some little thin little piece of uh, material. This is thick. This is something that you probably couldn't tear even if you tried. And on that day, we're told there's a huge earthquake, and the veil of the temple is torn from top to bottom, signifying that the way to God now is open. You weren't allowed to approach God because of your sin. But Christ has done something to open the way for you to have a relationship with God. And what is that? He died for your sins. And so through him, let's keep this in mind. Everything that is said here in these two verses, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand. How? Through him our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you one last question and we'll close. When you woke up this morning, why didn't you fear the wrath of God? I'm talking to believers now. Okay? I know there's people out there who could care less about God. The last thing on their mind when they wake up is God and the wrath of God. They have no concern for spiritual things. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking to believers. I'm not talking to those people who think that 
God is this Santa Claus up in the sky and everything is just fun. It's I'm not talking about that. And I'm not talking about people who have some kind of works righteousness who think that, well, maybe they're good enough and that's why they don't have to fear the wrath of God. Those people who think they're good enough because of their own works are highly delusioned. We're talking to, un to believers now. You know your heart. You know the things that you've said. You know the things that you've done. You know the things that have gone, in, gone on in your mind, things that no one else knows about, but you know, and God knows. Knowing all these terrible things that you have thought and said and done, why is it that even though you know you deserve the wrath of God, why is it that you woke up this morning and you were not afraid? And there is only one biblical answer to that. If you're hoping in yourself, there is no hope. The only biblical answer to that is the believer does not have to fear the wrath of God because the righteousness of Christ is accounted to us and the wrath of God that we deserved has been poured out upon him. Therefore, we can have peace with God now and access to the grace in which we stand. I think we'll stop there. We'll get into the... Rest of the verse next week. Let's pray.